Okay, good morning everyone. Glad to see not everyone started their spring recess early. Uh, we will spend some time this morning talking about uh, legged locomotion and then bipedal locomotion. And then obviously next week we won't be here and then we'll start up again the following week. A couple notes about uh, the assignments. So I put up uh, assignment seven for you. I put up assignment seven for you uh, on Tuesday. And in assignment seven, you're adding the sixth and final component to your robot, the synapses, which will finally close this loop between sensors, sensor neurons, synapses that connect sensor neurons to hidden neurons, synapses that connect hidden neurons to motor neurons, values from the motor neurons are sent to the motors, which are sent to the joints, which cause the links to change their uh, velocity, position, orientation, which changes the robot's relationship to its environment, which changes what it senses during the next time step of the simulation. So here we go. We'll finally close this, close this loop. That's part one of assignment seven. Uh, the second part is going to move on to this last part of the assignment sequence, which is you're going to now wrap this whole process in uh, an evolutionary algorithm, and you're going to allow that evolution to optimize various aspects of your robot's body uh, and brain. We're going to start with the synapses that connect the sensor neurons to any hidden neurons, if you have any. Some of you may not have hidden neurons. You may have synapses that connect the sensor neurons directly to the motor neurons. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter how you do it. Once you've got neurons and synapses implemented, you can wire up the brain of your robot however you like. It doesn't matter to us. So you're taking your groups of synapses, and we're going to then allow a series of increasingly powerful search methods or evolutionary methods to search for good values of those synapses to get your robot to do something uh, interesting, which at the moment will maybe not be that interesting, just forward locomotion, final project. You can change that to something else. We're going to start with probably the simplest search method you can imagine. Dream up 100 sets of synapses, try out each set one after the other, whichever one is best. Take a short video of your robot being animated with those synapses, send us that video, and you're done with assignment seven. Assignment eight, you'll be replacing the random search with a slightly more powerful evolutionary algorithm. Assignment nine, same thing again. Assignment 10, same thing again. Okay. Any questions about assignment seven, where we are, where we're going? All good? Okay. So uh, the week you get back from spring break, both assignments se seven and eight will be due. The reason why is I want to make sure we keep you on track so that you finish the assignment 10 in enough time that you'll have time to do something interesting for your final project. So nothing is due during spring break but two assignments are due when you get back. All good? Yes? On the blackboard quote that you said, I think it said it was due on the primary. Ah, uh, did, it, did it say that? I think you're right. OK, that is incorrect. It will be Monday, March 14th. Same with assignment 8. All good? OK, so uh, after the refactoring uh, assignment, and probably after you spend some time down in the the basement of your code, mucking about with neurons and synapses. It may be a little difficult to hold on to where everything exists in your code base. You've got simulate.py, generate.py. In assignment eight, when we're gonna start to, uh, we're gonna start to search for good sets of synapses, you're gonna have an evolve.py as well. This is a good time to step back from your code a little bit and look at the higher levels of your code hierarchy to make sure that you understand where everything is. In simulate.py, we've now refactored this so we have a class hierarchy. Inside simulate, you have robot.py. Robot.py houses a number of classes. Which are those classes? What sits inside of robot.py? Anybody remember? <laughs> yeah. Sensors and motors, yep. One more. Neural network. Neural network, right? What's inside neural network? There's two classes inside this. At least one, yep. Neurons. 
neurons, and you're going to be adding synapse.py, right? So if you get a little com confused while you're working down here and trying to wire up all of this stuff together, and your code is crashing, you're not sure what's going on, try and comment out some of these things and work your way back up to the class hierarchy. Inside robot.py, there are three important uh, functions, sense, think, and act. Especially as you're closing this loop in assignment seven, you can always comment out one or two, one or more of these functions, make sure that part is still working. If you comment out think and act, you can delve down into sense and make sure you're still capturing values from the sensors. Once you've convinced yourself that everything is working here, you can uncomment think and make sure values are flowing from your sensors to your sensor neurons, to your hidden neurons, to your motor neurons. Now that looks good. Now you can uncomment act and make sure the values from the motor neurons are getting to the motors. The motors are causing the joints to change on their own when you run your simulator and so on. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions about the assignments? No? Okay, a couple other housekeeping notes. Um, last week, there were a couple questions about the vulture question on the quiz. I definitely uh, worded that ambiguously. My apologies. Uh, if you lost half a point on the vulture question, I've returned that half a point to you. I just noticed this morning that I did not link the lecture notes for uh, today's lecture by Peter Locomotion. I just added them to the, the schedule now. My apologies. I also just added the reading there uh, just now. Okay, so uh, back to our discussion on locomotion. We've been looking in this section on the history of evolutionary robotics, different ways to approach um, the creation of intelligent machines in an embodied manner. We can come at it from the minimal cognition point of view, make everything as simple as possible, and start to evolve the building blocks of cognition and then work our way up from there. Since we're dealing in this course with robotics, uh, another important starting point is locomotion. Brains on Earth evolved to move animals around from point A to point B. Everything that came afterwards, everything else that our brains do, sits on top of this basic architecture of an organ that's designed to coordinate motion. So a lot of what we talk about in embodied cognition and robotics, either explicitly or implicitly, is the idea that we want to create machines that are able to move about in their world, reach out in their world, push against their world literally or figuratively, and observe how the world pushes back. And that is the strongest foundation upon which to build increasingly abstract uh, and uh, increasingly abstract forms of cognition. So we're taking time out in lecture 11 and 12 to talk about biomechanics uh, and the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of locomotion, at least as it exists in the animal kingdom. We started by uh, looking at this book by Alexander last time, Biomechanics, all the ways in which Mother Nature has figured out ways to get animals from point A to point B. And we've been anchoring our discussion around these four features of locomotion, different animals and different machines, as we'll see when we start to look at more locomoting robots, strike different trade-offs between displacement, robustness, energetics, and stability. We were introducing some of the terminology that's useful when we're talking about especially legged locomotion. We talked about stance phase, flight phase, and we ended last time by talking about static and dynamic uh, stability when an animal or a human or a robot is in motion. At any point in time, we can, uh, we can look to see which, if any, legs are in contact with the ground. And if we take those points of contact on the ground and draw a polygon, if we're then able to compute the center of mass of that organism or that machine and draw that position of the center of mass on the floor as well, as long as that center of mass is inside this polygon of support, generally speaking, the animal is statically stable or the machine is statically stable. It can stop motion and do something else at that point in time. If, uh, if at another point in time or during, in, when using a different gate or moving over a different environment, the center of mass is outside the polygon of support, the animal is not statically stable. It's possible that if it's if it stops moving, it will fall over. 
Dynamic stability is interesting, which is once you settle into a gate where you are not necessarily statically stable, you can recover when you're uh, faced with a perturbation. And we'll see an example of a robot that does that shortly. Okay. Uh, we were looking at a few figures that were taken from this book by Alexander, which again are looking at different animals and different trade-offs they have made during evolution between these four features. Here's an interesting example of uh, a set of ponies that were observed uh, walking or trotting or galloping around in their pen. They're just doing their own thing. From time to time, they break into these three different gates. The investigators observed what speeds these ponies were moving at when they were walking, trotting, or galloping. And on average, they were moving at these particular speeds. They took those ponies out of the paddock, put them on a very large treadmill, sped up or slowed down that treadmill, and trained those animals to keep a particular gait, even if it wasn't quote unquote comfortable for them. They could train a pony to trot at much faster speeds than a pony would normally trot at. And as perhaps you would expect, if you're able to measure the exchange of CO2 and O2 uh, that the animal is performing while on the treadmill, you can get a sense of how much energy it's burning while walking or trotting or galloping at different speeds on the treadmill. And the energy minima happen to fall at exactly those speeds at which they walk, trot, or gallop. Kind of makes sense, right? Okay. Okay, we've been talking about legged animals. We're going to focus mostly on mammals and ourselves. Uh, as usual, the octopus is always the outlier. Another legged animal. I'm not quite sure what gait this is, but on any lecture on uh, biomechanics or animals, there's always got to be an octopus video in there somewhere. This is our requisite octopus video. Okay. Maybe not very energy efficient, but there you go. Okay, so uh, first half of this lecture 11 is about animals. We're gonna switch now to robotics. We know quite a bit about the biomechanics of locomotion in animals. We can look at different animals and look at different trade-offs that they strike. Which ones of those and how do we incorporate those locomotion strategies into machines? Back in 2005, this video dropped uh, and shocked the robotics community. Up until 2005, uh, most roboticists on the planet had been focused on creating robots that were able to exhibit legged locomotion. Nowhere was, no one was anywhere close to the quality of Big Dog when it was released in 2005. It's interesting that it's a little dated at this point, but still very, uh, very uh, sophisticated. What trade-offs is Big Dog striking between robustness, displacement, energy, and stability? This is dynamic stability at work. Not statically stable, but it's able to recover its gait after a pretty large perturbation. Pretty slow, yeah, compared to some other four-legged animals. Big Dog is carrying 325 pounds on its back. I challenge you to do the same and go walk, go find an icy spot on campus and recover your footing while carrying 325 pounds. So maybe not as fast as certain four-legged mammals, but not bad. Seems to be pretty stable. Pretty stable, yeah. This, this was the challenge that, uh, that Boston Dynamics had solved at this point, was the stability problem. If you go back and watch legged uh, robot videos pre-2005, they all fall over. That was the missing link. How do, you keep, how do you keep something stable? There's a relatively sophisticated mathematical algorithm that Big Dog is running, and all of Boston Dynamics uh, machines now run. It's a bit of a trade secret, but people know more or less the general outline of how this works. We don't have time in this course to go into the details, but it took a lot of effort to figure out how this machine should move when it's, when it's perturbed, when it's outside its comfort zone, either when it's kicked by someone or when it moves into a new environment. So this is also related to robustness, right? It maintains stability in pretty diverse uh, environments. 
What about the energetics of Big Dog? Anybody know what the how it's running? What's the energy source for the for Big Dog? It's carrying 325 pounds on its back. Big Dog itself is pretty heavy. There's hydraulics involved, but what's the energy source? I was going to turn up the video. I was going to turn up the sound here. You can hear it. It's got a diesel, got a diesel engine on board. Yeah. So it's quite an energy hog, but still definitely state of the art at that time, and still arguably today state of the art. This was a this was a huge event in robotics at the time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you Big Dog Beta. This was a quick follow-up to uh, Big Dog that appeared a short time later. Sorry. Has anybody seen Big Dog Beta before? What's the innovation of Big Dog Beta over Big Dog Alpha? This one definitely has feet. It's got, four, it's got four human feet and two silly humans inside. Not bad. They're actually not as robust as Big Dog Alpha, as you can see. OK. You know you've made it big in robotics when somebody makes a parody video of your work. Okay, so legged locomotion in robotics has now more or less uh, been solved. Um, the rest of this lecture, this is definitely not as sophisticated as Big Dog. I'm going to walk you through one of my old papers trying to, again, explore this issue of the trade-off between robustness, stability, energetics, and displacement. Uh, in this work, together with uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, we asked the following question. What aspects of a robot's body plan affects its ability, it affects the ability to evolve locomotion for it. So in this experiment, as you can see, we simulated, I simulated 10 different robots. You could probably build all of these relatively easily uh, in PyBullet or uh, PyroSim at this point. And we then tried to keep everything else about these robots exactly the same. So although these robots have different bodies, they all have exactly the same number of sensors and motors. They have exactly the same neural network inside. They all have exactly the same fitness function. The fitness function is going to select for controllers that move the robot as quickly as possible. And we're going to use exactly the same optimizer. We're going to use exactly the same evolutionary algorithm. We're going to evolve neural network controllers for all 10 of these robots. So the only thing we're varying is the body. Everything else stays the same. We're going to see at the end of this experiment which of these 10 robots was evolution best able to produce a fast uh, gait for. OK. We kept the number of sensors and motors the same. This might be difficult to see from the back of the room. But I've tagged on each of these uh, eight M's. So some of these robots have more links. They're made up of more body parts than others. Some of the connections between these links are fixed joints. These are joints that remove all six mechanical degrees of freedom between the connected pairs of links. So basically, we're welding these pairs of links shut. Wherever there is an M, there is a rotational joint. There is a rotational joint being controlled by a motor. There are four T's tagged on each of these robots, four touch sensors. You can see in the case of the quadrupedal robots, it kind of makes sense where to put the touch sensors. In these snake robots and some of these others, I kind of had to guess and put them at various locations around the body. They're also uh, assigned to each robot four A's. These are four angle sensors which we've talked about already as proprioceptive sensors. So sensors that return the angle of a joint as it's rotating uh, in the simulation. So since each robot has four touch sensors, four and four angle sensors, and eight motors, we can connect up 
the sensors to the motors in exactly the same way in every robot, even though they have different bodies. You'll notice we have our sensor neurons here. We have three hidden neurons here, eight motor neurons. All of the sensor neurons are connected to all the hidden neurons. All the hidden neurons are connected to each other, including themselves. And all of the hidden neurons are connected to all of the motor neurons. There are two additional neurons, B1 and B2. These are bias neurons. We talked about biases when we talked about CTRNNs. What do you think bias neurons do? What's the output of a bias neuron? Given our discussion about biases and CTRNNs. This is not a CTRNN. This is back to a normal feed-forward neural network. What does a bias neuron do? And why might we want to have them? Absolutely. So each bias neuron has a static or a fixed number. In this case, it's just plus one. It doesn't actually matter what the number is, as long as it's constant. And then we have synapses emanating out from the bias neuron to the hidden layer, and synapses out from the second bias neuron to the motor, uh, to the motor neurons. Evolution can evolve the weights of these synapses as well as all the other synapses. What might be the use of a bias neuron? Any ideas? To look at that like initial state. Uh, that's a good. That's a very good observation. So, uh, at, at initial state, imagine that the touch sensors and the angle sensors have values near zero. In in your work, the touch sensors are plus one and minus one. In this work, touch sensors could be zero or one. It's possible for the robot to get into a situation where all the sensor values are more or less zero. Without bias neurons, and also without recurrent connections, we'll just simplify our discussion for a moment. If we have a purely feed-forward network where synapses flow from sensor neurons to hidden neurons to motor neurons, and all of the sensor neurons are zero, what can you tell me about the values that are likely to arrive at the motor layer? Given what you now know about how we compute or how we propagate values from input to hidden to output. If all the sensor neurons are more or less zero, what, what values are you likely to get at the motor layer? They're all mostly going to be zero as well, right? So you can get into a situation where a robot enters the flight, st uh, flight uh, stance, so it leaves the ground or the flight phase. All of the feet are off the ground, all the touch sensors are zero, and the joints have angles that are pretty close to their default angles, which are zero. The only thing a robot can do in that situation is freeze, right? All of the motor values are gonna be zero. If you're in the flight phase, if you're in the air and you need to prepare to land, like Big Dog, for example, you might wanna do something other than freeze. It's not quite clear what you should do, but the bias neurons allow the robot to exhibit non-zero motor values, even if almost all, even if all of the sensor sensor neurons are almost zero. Whether or not this is useful in this experiment, who knows? We just threw them in just in case. Okay, we've got robots one through ten. We're gonna we're gonna start a little betting pool here. I'm gonna show you the results in a moment. Which body plan? is going to be most amenable to the evolution of fast locomotion. The fitness function is only going to select for displacement, how far it can get from the origin. doesn't matter how much energy it uses. Some of these robots are going to have to grapple with stability. Some are not. Obviously, if you're on the ground and you stay on the ground, you don't have to worry about stability. Any bets? Which one is most likely, which one are we most likely going to be able to evolve fast locomotion for? Number one, three. Number three? How come number three? Um, it's very stable and it has um, It's very stable, so it's relatively hard for this, for this robot number three to fall over. Its legs are relatively vertical. When we were talking about uh, reptiles before uh, that have uh, horizontally aligned legs. If you're keeping your body low to the ground, 
It's good for stability, but not so good for energetics and also not so good for displacement. You're dragging your body along the ground. That'll often slow you down. So getting up off the ground and having vertical legs uh, is generally a good idea. So th three sounds like a pretty good bet. Three, six. How come six? Well, it looks like it has like knees. So it's got knees? Like similar to how some like biological evolution has like constructed the back land of all. Yeah, okay. So some of these look a little bit more reminiscent of animals that are already out there and some relatively fast moving animals. If we look at the small scale, if we look at insects, six-legged animals, insects are very, very fast, right? Try and catch a cockroach with your bare hands, next to impossible, right? If we look at the macro scale, at our scale, obviously quadrupedal body plans uh, seem to be pretty fast. Cheetahs, gazelles, lions, tigers. Any other bets? We've got one for three, one for six. Okay, how come number nine? Uh, just with the like, same set of legs it has, like it could give up like some legs that are not suitable for it, so it's going to move itself. Okay, it could flip over itself, right? I haven't given you the details about the range of motion of these joints. Some of them might be able to roll end over end, which is also a relatively fast mode of transport. One vote for three, one for six, one for nine. All right, let's do a quick poll. Who, who thinks number one is going to win? No? Number two? Three, a couple votes for three, four, five, six, a couple votes for six, seven. Uh, I want to just talk about five and seven for a moment. It may be difficult to see. The feet on the two snakes here on five and seven are little cylinders so that this, uh, especially number seven, that it can't fall over. So five and seven don't really need to worry about stability either. Any votes for eight? Nine? Oh, quite a few votes for nine. Ten? Our triped? All right, thank you. Okay, one vote for ten. All right, hold on to your vote. Okay. We did multiple evolutionary trials for each of these robots, one through ten. And in each of these sets of trials, we pulled out the neural network that caused the robot, the, the most fit neural network, the neural network that caused the robot to move as fast as possible. I'm deliberately hiding the fitness curves from you yet, uh, from you. This is a footprint graph. This is a way of visualizing not how far an animal or a robot moves, but how it moves. Let's take uh, the best Neural network controller for robot one, which we go back for a moment, is a quadruped up here. So it's got four feet. It's got four links or four body parts that can come into contact with the ground. So in the footprint graph for this robot, we allocate four rows, one for each of the four feet. And each column corresponds to one time step in the simulation. And we paint a pixel black if that foot is in contact with the ground during that time step and leave it white if the foot is not in contact with the ground during that time step. What can you tell me about the movement of this robot using the most fit neural network controller evolved for it? How does it cause the robot to move? Yep, so it's keeping two feet on the ground while uh, moving the other two more or less together. Not perfectly, but kind of. The footprint graph doesn't tell you which foot is which, but if it did, you could probably identify which particular uh, quadrupedal gait this is. I think it's Cantor. I don't remember. I'll have to go back and have a look at the paper. What can you tell me about the other nine neural networks, the best neural networks for the other nine robots? How what Can you... Can you tell me anything about how well they did? We're still not looking at displacement yet. We still don't know how fast they caused the robot to move. What other patterns can you see here? Wait, the second, the second one looks like a very stable pattern it's receiving, so that's probably good for you all. Absolutely, right? So very, very stable oscillations generally correspond to fast displacement, right? Every legged animal on Earth, including us, if you want to move at a very fast speed, you need to have a very, very regular gait. If you don't, 
then those hitches in the gate are going to slow you down, and also you're going to take a pretty severe uh, energetic hit. Right? So generally, the cleanliness of the oscillation is a good indicator, a good proxy for speed. What other patterns can you see here? Generally speaking, most of these footprint graphs are reporting a relatively clean oscillation. Some are a little cleaner than others. Ah, exactly. So another nice thing you can see from a footprint graph is you can identify whether or not the animal or the machine has a flight phase. As you mentioned, for robot number nine, which was this robot here, whatever it's doing, it's exerting enough energy to spend a considerable fraction of the gate cycle off the ground. For any column in a footprint graph where all the pixels are white, that means all the points of contact are off the ground. Which other robots here have a flight phase? Nine has one. Five, uh, five does, yet you could, there's definitely points in which all points of contact are off the ground. Two does not. Put four might, and then eight might too. Four does, four definitely does, eight definitely does. Does having a flight phase compared to not tell you anything about the speed of the machine? For those that have for the robots here that have a longer flight phase or where they're spending more time off the ground as a fraction of the gate cycle, you think that means they're moving faster? Absolutely, they could be jumping straight up and down. I don't know if anybody remembers the old Looney Tunes cartoon with Pepe Le Pew, the skunk. He would exhibit what's known as pronking. All four feet would leave the ground at the same time and he'd spend a long time in the flight phase, but Pepe was never really in much of a hurry, right? Okay. Okay, a few more hints for you. Uh, again, you'll have apologies for these videos. Uh, these are 2002 vintage videos here. Here's the best neural network controller for Robot 6. I know there was a couple votes for Robot 6. One of the quadrupeds. See if I can maximize this one. No. Here's one of the, here's the best controller for one of the worm robots. We talked about this particular form of locomotion right at the beginning of this lecture when we were talking about Alexander's book. What form of locomotion is this? It's a variation of this particular form of locomotion. What do you notice about this particular gate? There's no flight phase, yeah. Other observations? It, it has this like wave oscillation to it where it propagates forward, like in the direction that it's moving. Yeah, so there's a propagating wave. This neural network has figured out how to produce this propagating wave, which causes the robot to move forward. Where have we seen that before? Where did we discuss that before last week? With worms, right? So earthworms that are pushing themselves uh, through loose uh, earth. When you swallow food, same uh, strategy is being used by the muscles in your throat. What is this strategy? Mother Nature discovered this very early and she's repurposed this all over the place. Here it is reemerging again. Peristalsis. peristalsis, yeah, exactly. It's kind of a form of peristalsis. Okay, here's the tripod. Definitely not a very clean oscillation. Unlike Big Dog, I don't think I'd want to kick this robot from the side. I don't think it's going to recover very well. A 
Okay. I don't think, I don't know if anyone voted. Oh, someone took a vote for, for the TriFed. Thank you for taking one for the team. Okay. There we go. All right. Here's the fitness curves for all 10. We have evolutionary time on the horizontal axis and displacement, which is equal to fitness in this case, on the vertical uh, axis. Six, two, and three are, I would say, more or less tied for first. They're close enough, it's kind of hard to distinguish between them. So let's go back and have a look at six, two, and three. There's two, three, and six. I think most of the votes this morning landed on one of those three robots. Well done. Five and seven did particularly poorly. Five and seven were our two worm robots. Any ideas why two, three, and six did particularly well and five and seven did particularly poorly? Good question. Uh, yeah, good, good question. So all of these robots have exactly eight motorized joints. If they have any additional joints beyond eight, they're all welded shut. And they all have the same, uh, they all have the same maximum torque, right? So each robot can apply the same total force. Whether the neural network evolves to do so or not, that's a different matter. Some of them are made up of more or less links, and each link has the same mass, exactly like in your simulations. So some robots are heavier than others. Is that a good thing or a bad thing here? Does weight help or hurt you if the only thing you're trying to move, the only thing you're trying to do is move as quickly as possible, and energetics doesn't matter? Not really, right? Actually, mass can help you, right? Momentum. What is it about the worms that sets them at a disadvantage? Any ideas? After we got this result back in 2002, we weren't sure either. So we started to plot some of the features of morphology against performance. Was it because uh, five and seven had more pieces and they were heavier and that actually worked against them under these settings? Uh, was it the number of points of contact? So the worms have many points of contact with the ground. So maybe like reptiles, they take a hit because they're dragging uh, a lot of uh, parts of their body along the ground. Here's what we found. So on the horizontal axis here, we have uh, sorted the robots from the lightest robot to the heaviest robot. Each, uh, each robot is made up, uh, each, each robot's body part or link has a mass of one. Uh, so robot six here, the, the hexapod, uh, has 41 parts, so it's got a mass of 41. Robot number one, there's robot number one up there, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 parts, so it's much lighter than the hexapod. And then we plotted on the vertical axis the average performance. So among all the evolutionary trials we did on robot number one, and we took out the best neural network, how fast did it cause robot number one to move? We took the best neural, net, the, the best neural networks evolved against robot four, how far did those neural networks cause the robot to move, and so on. What do you think? Does mass dictate performance here? Not really. There's a bit of a trend, it looks like, but there's clearly some outliers. And the three outliers, two, three, and six, are exactly the ones that did particularly well. So under these simplifying conditions, mass does not predict how well evolution was able to evolve fast locomotion. Next plot here, we took the same data, but now we rearranged the robots in order of increasing points of contact. So the two worm robots, five and seven, they had 10 feet that could come into contact with the ground, so they're up here. And robot number 10, the triped, has three points of contact with the ground. 
Does the number of points of contact correlate at all with performance? I see some nods, right? So there's a bit of a bell curve here. So uh, generally speaking, too many points of contact is not so good, and too few points of contact are not so good, which kind of makes sense given our discussion about biomechanics, right? Lots of body parts dragging against the ground, and over here, as you saw in the video, the triped is struggling with stability. Four or six legs seems to be like a pretty good solution, which is what we generally tend to see in land-legged uh, land uh, animals, insects and mammals, four or six legs. Okay, last experiment uh, we did in this, uh, in this manuscript was to now fold in a change to the neural network. What I've just shown you is we varied the body, but we kept everything else the same. Now we're gonna rerun all 10 robots. We're gonna re-evolve neural networks on all 10 of these robots, but instead of evolving neural networks with three hidden layers, we're gonna expand the hidden layer to five nodes. We're gonna increase the brains of these robots and allow evolution to try again. Robots one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 10, arranged along the horizontal axis. Vertical axis is again, average uh, performance. The light gray bars is the data we had from before. And the dark gray bars is how fast on average we could evolve these robots to move when they had bigger brains. What impact did these bigger brains have, if any, on these robots? Did it help? Yeah, it helped like everything but one of the several ways. Absolutely. So it helps in this case. So orchestration of the movement of the legs, regardless of body plan, more brain power is helpful. Which again is somewhat reassuring because that's where biological brains evolved with, trying to organize all the various body parts to produce efficient, fast locomotion in a particular direction. Yep. Is there Great question. I, I wanted to do that, I ran out of time. What would happen if we went up to seven hidden neurons or 70 hidden neurons? Is there a diminishing returns here? How much brain do you need to move very fast? And is diminishing returns different for different, for different body plans? So it generally helped across all 10 robots did it help some robots better than others? Yeah, which ones? Uh, it, actually not. Which ones did it help more? Uh, seven, double the speed on Double, uh, that's right. And number seven was one of the worm, worm robots and number five was the other worm robot. So generally speaking, Bigger brains help the worm robots quite a bit more. Now the worm robots were already doing pretty poorly compared to the other eight robots. So maybe they were already at a significant disadvantage so bigger brains helped more. Why? Why might the worms benefit more from additional neural real estate compared to the legged robots? When they move, it has to be pretty precise, right? This peristaltic motion, you gotta get this wave traveling all the way from the back to the front of the robot to cause it to move forward. Turns out in peristalsis, you can also do the reverse. There are waves that can travel from the head to the back, which move the animal forward. That's what earthworms do. But getting that traveling wave to ripple perfectly along the body given this neural architecture is tricky. It needs more neural real estate to organize all the body parts to do the right thing at the right time, which is the prevailing theory for why brains evolved in the first place. Animals started to have more and more muscles, more and more joints, ligaments, bones. You have to organize all of those parts to move very carefully together to find a mate, av avoid a predator, find food, travel long distances. Brains evolved initially as puppeteers. They had to pull on lots of different motors to make sure everything worked just right. Okay.
Okay. Any questions about that before we move on to our particular specialty way of moving? No? Okay. All right, on to, okay. Again, you are all world experts at this particular form of locomotion. You exhibit it all day, every day for decades. Why only walking and running? We have two gates, generally speaking, that we feel comfortable moving at. There, as uh, Mr. Cleese just showed us, there's an infinite possible number of gates. Why just two? They work very well for what we need to do, for how our bodies are put together. We just saw in the previous lecture, there are complex relationships between brain, body, environment, energetics. Turns out that for this particular body plan, there are two ways of moving that are comfortable at different speeds. Usually when we're thinking about bipedal locomotion, you're usually focusing on your legs. What other parts of your body contribute to uh, efficient execution of walking and running. Your arms, your arms how so? Um, they help. How do they help? With rhythm. with rhythm, okay. So you often use your arms to help with maintaining the cleanliness of your gait cycle. How? In walking and running? Swinging of the arms helps with momentum, helps with stability. How? You're all world experts, You've got decades of experience. When you run, you feel like the foot forward, you feel the arm go forward. Absolutely. So when your left leg goes out, sorry, you were saying? Balance. Balance. So when your left leg goes out, your uh, your right arm goes out and vice versa. Why? What's what's happening here? It has to do with stability. Absolutely, right? So you can practice the Ministry of Silly Walks at home tonight in the privacy of your own room so no one can see you doing so. Try moving without swinging your arms. And if you have enough room in your apartment, try moving at faster and faster speeds without moving your arms. You're going to end up on the floor pretty quickly, right? So we, as you start moving at faster speeds, you start to create torsion, which remember torque is rotational force torsion around your long axis. So your body will start to twist in one direction. If you swing your arm out in the other way, it cancels out that torsion, keeps you heading in more or less the right direction. Helps with stability, also helps with energetics as well. Is that it? Just your arms? Anybody here in track and field? If you ever spend any time trying to get really good at running, either sprinting or even long distances, it takes years of practice to become good. It takes very, very careful orchestration of all parts of your body, right? Even for things that obviously feel blindingly easy to us, like walking and running, thinking about thinking is misleading. It's extremely difficult. And as we just saw in the case of Big Dog, it took roboticists a long time to solve legged locomotion. Here's an example uh, of the pre-Big Dog era. This is Honda's Asimo robot, meant to be short for uh, Isaac Asimov. You're gonna see uh, Asimo running at nine kilometers an hour in a moment. Okay, obviously I haven't told you anything about Asimo yet. Who's seen Asimo before? It's a little, little dated at this point, a couple people, okay. What can you tell me about Asimo? Doesn't swing its arms. Doesn't swing its arms, yeah. What else is going on here? How does this differ from your running gait? It's like the gait is very, uh, very like small. Very small, it's taking very small, quick steps. And as we saw from one of the Alexander plots in the previous uh, uh, in the previous lecture, this is not energy efficient, right? You can tell just by looking at it, this is very energy inefficient. It's flat footed. You'll notice that it's landing uh, on, the, on the flat of its foot. When you run, you definitely don't. Why don't you? 
When you're a good runner, you usually either actually uh, land on the strategy of hitting with your heel or the balls of your feet. Like you land on the ball of your foot, which absorbs some shock. It absorbs some shock, so it's good, better, better on your body. When you land on the ball of your foot, you can feel your Achilles tendon, that tendon in the back of your leg, stretching. You're basically loading a spring. You, your tendon is capturing a lot of the energy of the motion. And then as you rock over your stance foot and that foot starts to release from the ground, it is basically like a released spring and pushes you forward. Asimo is not doing any of that. It's taking small, short steps. Does Asimo have a flight phase? It's hard to tell, right? I think uh, it depends on which version of Asimo, but generally speaking, the Asimos did not have a flight phase. What you're looking at is actually walking, or more technically crouching, that's just sped up. Asimo is actually statically stable most of the time. You could turn off the motors and it wouldn't fall over because that's an easier gait to produce and fine tune on a machine than the gates you saw on Big Dog. Given what we've said up till now about Asimo, question? Yeah, are Big Dog and Asimo evolutionary at all? Or are you like these, are not evolved, uh, these are not evolved machines. What we're gonna see in a moment is the evolution of bipedal locomotion. Yeah, neither, neither were evolved. These were Asimo was programmed by hand. Big Dog was produced by reinforcement learning, a type of machine learning uh, that's not evolutionary. Given what I've told you about Asimo so far, what can you tell me about uh, Asimo's backpack? Asimo's got this silver backpack. What do you think's in the backpack? It's a, it's a heavy, heavy battery. Asimo is extremely energy inefficient, but very stable. So the researchers who built Asimo, they were limited by the technology at the time, late 90s technology. They struck on the solution of maximizing stability at the cost of energetics. That's one robot. I'm gonna show you another robot that now strikes the opposite trade-off. This is the passive dynamic walker. It was built at Cornell uh, in the early 2000s. Obviously moves very, very different from Asimo. What can you tell me about the passive dynamic walker just from the video? It looks like it does a redo where it like lifts a leg up and its momentum brings it forward a little bit. Absolutely. This is much more like our walking gait. I was imagining you're less uh, statically stable. It's less statically stable, absolutely. You'll notice the very nervous human handler staying very, very close to the robot. It's not very stable, right? Very nice observation. Pay careful attention if you can see it to the shape of the feet. Uh, I worked in the lab next to this lab and these guys would stay there late into the night with a nail file, shaving off the underside of this foot to get the curvature just right. The passive dynamic walker pays a huge cost in stability and also robustness. It works in a very, very, very narrow environmental niche, which is this set of planks at this particular decline. If you take the uh, passive dynamic walker and put it on flat ground, it doesn't walk. So it's, it's taken a huge hit in terms of stability, robustness, also displacement, doesn't move very quickly, all in order to gain on the fourth feature, which is energy efficiency. How energy efficient is it? I was gonna ask, are there any motors on it or is it just? What do you uh, think? No motors. It has no motors, what else doesn't it have? Brain. Sorry? No brain. No brain. You see any batteries? No battery, no circuitry, 
no sensors. You can make a case that this isn't really even a robot at all. It's just a mechanism. Again, very surprising at the time. It tells us a lot, not just about the biomechanics of motion and robotics. It tells us something about our own form of a locomotion that evolved. This is why bipedal locomotion is so energy efficient. Uh, it has no muscles to relax in the swing foot when it's moving down the plank. So how is it able to move at all? Where, where is the energy coming from? If it has no batteries, no motors, where is the energy to travel coming from, right? Conservation of energy, it's got to be coming from somewhere. Yep, the decline is very important. Got to remember your high school physics here. Gravitational potential energy, right? So we place the robot at the top of the decline. So we increase the amount of potential energy. And then as this mechanism starts to move down the decline, if it's designed correctly, it's able to translate potential energy into kinetic energy. Yeah? <laughs> Not that different from putting a ball on the top of a decline and watching it uh, accelerate down the decline. OK. An interesting place to start from robotics and also, again, for trying to create intelligent uh, machines. It's a good starting point, obviously, but it's taken this huge cost. It, it takes this huge hit in these other three features. So how do we move on from the passive dynamic walker? Here's one way you can do so. Here's one step away from the passive dynamic walker. Pardon the pun. This is, uh, this is the Denise robot which is a hybrid dynamic walker. And I'll put this on loop here. As mentioned on the slide here, during part of the gait cycle, it is powered. So there are motors here. And in other parts of the gait cycle, the leg swings freely. When is the leg powered and when is it not? They're gonna apply a force the motors are going to apply a force to the joint, and then they're going to shut off again. And when the leg is in contact with the force, it'd be powered, and then the other leg would be almost like, like you would do, like turning the wheel. OK, so close. So you mentioned when the leg is in contact with the ground. But the leg can be in contact with the ground when the leg is out in front of the robot. You don't want to apply any force then, because you'll actually push yourself backwards. The back leg. So it's a little difficult to see in this video. Probably best to go home and watch it and maximize it and put it on loop. You'll notice that when the stance foot gets to its furthest back rotation, when it's behind the robot, just when that foot is about to leave the ground, there is an impulse force. The motor gives a bit of a push to the robot, and it kicks off with its back foot. And that introduces a little bit of energy into the system to push the whole robot forward. The investigators were not without a sense of humor. They put a bucket as the robot's head to remind us that although there's a little bit of a brain here, there's a small circuit that is determining when exactly to apply this impulse force. It's pretty small. So this was 2004. You might not even be able to see the circuitry. It's very small relative to the size of the robot. So we're starting at this extremal point in the space of all possible ways of moving, the passive dynamic walker. And then we're, we're sort of making it slightly less extreme. We're introducing a little bit more energy. We're making uh, this robot a little less energy efficient relative to the passive dynamic walker. And by doing so, we're gaining what? Denise here is less energy efficient than the passive dynamic walker, but what does Denise gain for that cost? It's a lot on platform. Absolutely. So robustness has increased for this robot. It's able to walk now on flat ground on its own. And again, you notice the nervous human handler nearby, still not very stable. OK. Passive dynamic uh, locomotion is a lot of fun. Um, on your spring recess, I'm sure you have nothing better to do than make some from uh, paper. You can try and make one yourself. 
Takes a little bit of doing, actually, but it's, it's possible. And on the next slide, I'll show you my favorite passive dynamic walker. I have a slanting driveway at home. I've tried this. It's not, not trivial, but possible. OK. A great example, again, of minimal cognition, right? Starting with something very, very simple and trying to work up from there. OK. So uh, as was mentioned, everything we looked at, we just looked at, was not evolved. In the second part of Lecture 12, we're going to look at this particular experiment. It's described in the reading uh, for today. In this particular experiment, the researchers asked the following question. Instead of staying up all night in the lab with a nail file and trying to figure out on your own how to get the curvature of the feet just right for a passive dynamic walker, can we evolve the body of the passive dynamic walker? Can we evolve the body of a mechanism, maybe not even a robot? Can we evolve the body of this thing to produce passive dynamic locomotion? Most of what we've talked about so far is evolving the synapses or evolving the brain and leaving the body constant. This is the inverse. There is no body in a passive dynamic walker. We're only going to evolve, uh, we're only going to evolve the body to see if we can achieve passive dynamic walking. And if that's possible, and we wouldn't be talking about this paper if they'd failed, they succeeded. They did succeed. Once you evolve passive dynamic walking, can you continue evolution to now tune the robot or transform it from a passive dynamic walker into a hybrid dynamic walker? I'll flip back and forth between these two slides. And hopefully, if you look at the ground, the choice of texture here was a little unfortunate. You'll notice there's the passive dynamic walker on a slight decline. And there's a slightly different version, an evolved descendant of this robot that's able to exhibit hybrid dynamic locomotion on flat ground. So we're going to look at it, this experiment, which has two parts. We're going to start with this and move on to this. We've seen a number of multi-part evolutionary runs before, where we evolve one ability and then gradually evolve it into another. What, was that con what, what concept is being embodied by these kinds of experiments? It's easier to evolve, a it turns out it's easier to evolve a passive dynamic walker from scratch than it is to evolve a hybrid dynamic walker from scratch. So we'll start with the easier thing and then move on to the harder thing. What's this concept? We've seen several times now. Scaffolding, Scaffolding right? Okay. All right, so how did the investigators do this? Here's the basic overview of their robot. In this case, uh, again, there's no sensor, sensor neurons, hidden neurons, motor neurons, motors, but there are joints and links causing the mechanism to interact with its environment. We have, uh, we have a total of uh, one, two, three, four, five joints on each uh, side of the body. In the hip, we have two hinge joints, which allow the leg to do this and the leg to do this. One degree of freedom in the knee, like we have, and then two, uh, two in the ankle. So this and this. Yeah. So five joints on one side, another five on the other side. We've got a total of 10 joints. They then added a series of just masses to different parts of the body. And evolution is going to play with these masses. In essence, what evolution is going to do is alter the mass distribution of this robot to try and produce passive dynamic walking. OK, here's an actual snapshot of this robot. We've got our one, two, three, four, five joints. In red, you can see these one, two, three, four, five masses that have been added. We're adding one mass to the waist up here. Two masses are going to be added uh, to the thigh, M sub T. We're going to add uh, two more masses to the shank, and I'm sorry, there's a sixth and seventh mass that are embedded in the feet. So these seven, uh, these seven uh, mass pieces can be moved around and altered in size 
to alter the mass distribution of the robot. They're also going to play with some other things, which is the length of the leg segment. So how tall should the robot be? If evolution alters L, they're going to produce taller or shorter uh, robots. X, Y uh, sub T and X, Y sub S. This is the X and Y offsets of the thigh and shank masses. So in the case of M sub S here, the shank masses, you can see in this case the mass is on the front of the shank, whereas the masses on the thigh are embedded in the thigh. So evolution can also play around with the relative position, where the mass is glued or attached to the thigh or the shank. Uh, uh, some other things they're going to play with is foot length, bigger feet, smaller feet, which is better for passive dynamic walking. It's not immediately clear. Waist radius, this one's not too important. B sub Y is very important. This is the starting hip angle around the Y axis here. So here's the Y axis. Right leg, um, how far out is the right leg going to be placed when they put the robot at the top of the decline and then let the robot go? They can, evolution is going to play with different angles for starting that right leg out forward. Why did they bother doing that? Why didn't they just start with the robot with both feet on the ground? And then push it down the decline. Because it's passive, they still need some way of starting the operation. Absolutely, right? So if you start a mechanism with both feet on the ground, you push it from the top of a decline, doesn't matter what distribution it has, it's going, it's going down the decline head first, right? So by tinkering with B sub Y, we're actually starting with the starting the initial conditions to get this to work. Okay. All right, a couple other details um, that we haven't seen yet in any of the simulated robots is to add some additional springs. We were just talking about the Achilles tendon. Your tendons and ligaments, most of the time in your body, they, they act like springs. So let's talk about springs for a moment if you haven't uh, seen, the, if you haven't characterized springs before. There's lots of different ways to model springs. The simplest way to model a spring is with two numbers stiffness and damping. Stiffness is how much a spring resists pulling and pushing. I want you to imagine I take a paper clip, a very thin piece of wire, I undo the paper clip and then recoil it into a spring. If you pull and push on a spring made up of a coil of very thin metal, it has very low stiffness. It takes really relatively little force to pull or push it away from what's known as its resting length. If you neither pull nor push on a spring, it has a length that it likes to rest at. That's its resting length. Stiffness says how much force is required to push or pull it away from that resting length. Damping is if you do pull or push on it and let go, and it starts to vibrate, how long does it take until it settles back to its resting length? You can think about these two, you can reason about stiffness and damping by thinking about springs with different stiffness and damping coefficients. Let's start with high stiffness. So let's imagine I take a very thick piece of metal, coil it into a spring. It's going to take a lot of force to pull it away from its resting length. So in my little cartoon axes here, I want you to think of the vertical axis as the the length of the spring relative to its resting length. So a height of zero here, y equals zero, means at that time the spring is at its resting length. A y that's a positive y value is the spring is longer than its resting length. A negative y value represents a spring that's been compressed. It's shorter than its resting length. So in this cartoon example here, at this particular point in time, imagine I've stretched the spring to beyond its resting length and then let go. It's going to shrink. It's going to reach its resting length and then overshoot. It's going to keep compressing. Now it's shorter than its resting length, back and forth, back and forth. If it also has high damping, it will relatively quickly come to rest. Uh, let's do high stiffness and no damping. 
So again, takes a lot of force to push or pull it away from its resting length. But if we let go, it will continue to vibrate for a very long time before reaching its resting length. Low stiffness, we have a slinky or we have a very, we have a very uh, weak spring. We let go and it has high damping, relatively quickly comes to its resting length. And actually, I'm sorry, this is the slinky down here. A slinky has low stiffness and no damping. It, if you, it'll just keep oscillating back and forth forever unless some other force acts on it to slow it down. Okay, we have uh, five joints on each side. We have, uh, we, have, uh, we have five springs on each side of the body as well. We have two springs in the hip. One is attached to the center of the robot's body. The other is attached at the top of its hip here. So this spring is pulling the leg inward towards the center of the body. And this spring out here, if the leg rotates forward or rotates backwards, the spring is trying to pull the leg back to vertical. So two springs pulling on two motorized joints. This is actually quite anthropomorphic. Your muscles and tendons and ligaments work together. Often your muscles are working against your ligaments, like stretching them, and then later your ligaments snap back and apply force and help you move. So there is interesting back and forth between the springs in your body and your motors, same thing in this robot. Okay, uh, we've got a bunch in the, we've got two springs in the hip. We have uh, one spring at the knee. The, the spring in the knee is doing the same thing. It's always trying to pull the, the leg back to vertical. And we also have uh, two springs, two springs in the ankle, one and two. Here's our two springs in the ankle. You can get a sense of kind of what they're doing as well. This one is actually not quite the Achilles heel. It's kind of the opposite. It's kind of pulling the toes up towards the shin of the robot. Okay, we're out of time for today. We will pause here. You have a quiz due tonight. Neither assignment seven nor eight is due this coming week, but both are due the Monday you're back from spring recess. Have a great week off, get some R&R. &R. We'll see you uh, not this coming Tuesday, the following one.